Rachel called me and asked me to come and give a presentation, and I, I didn't, when I got ready to prepare it, I thought, oh, I better look at the title. And so it was a little different than I kind of was anticipating, but it's something that I really like talking about and understanding who your consumer is or your customer, and we've heard a lot of that today, who your customer is. But your consumer is probably a different person because that's anybody that lives here in Joplin or in Dallas or Kansas City or all across the United States. And those things and those things change a lot. And right now during this time that we've been going through since March, that question is probably even a different answer because one thing that I don't have an extension appointment at Oklahoma State, we don't have a means extension person. But we have gotten countless calls about wanting to open beef packing facility or small facilities, and I don't think I've told a single person that's a good idea yet. Um, because you run the numbers and it just doesn't look good. So that now, right now during this time, it, it may it looks a lot better, and you can. But I think established places, because maybe by the time you got up and running or built one from the ground up, things would definitely maybe be against you again. So there's there's a lot of challenges, but a lot of things consumers are talking about that may be different than they were three or four months ago. So, yeah, other way. Okay, so I probably, this part is gonna be difficult because I don't have an internet connection, so I, if you, will you put it just on not presentation mode? Then they can see the pictures. Thank you. So I can just ask, because I, I really got, had some good, like, interactive things with the audience. Just to stay back. So with the, um, first I'll talk, oh, escape one more. Okay, there we go. So as we, um, I'll, I'll just skip over what I had in the outline there. I'm going to ask you guys some questions as we talk and discuss. And if we think about these two pictures, um, and we talk about quality, or we talk about your preference. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. That we think about which one of these is higher quality, which and that depends. It depends on how you define quality. Do you define quality solely based on price? If you define quality that way, the bottom one is your choice. If you define quality solely based on name brand, you pick the top one. If you are very discerning in your taste, you might pick the top one. I don't pick either because I'm a loyalist to Dr. Pepper. So that's, uh, <laughs> so that's a challenge. And then, which brand are you most loyal to? I use this in class a lot, and it's it's pretty interesting because, I mean, we'll have, it just as many of us are, we have very distinct choice here, and we don't deviate. And um, they asked Max a little bit earlier, and fun fact, he, my hometown where I grew up was really close to his ranch, and kind of out in the middle of North Texas. So, and you don't, if you deviate and you have a bad experience, you go back, or you just don't ever deviate. If you've had a bad experience, then you pick another new brand and see how it works. And then this picture is from my PhD research, and this question uh, is, these animals just happen to be in the same pen, and we've heard a lot about consistency today, and sorting, and these probably should have been sorted, right? Uh, so, and you ask this question, and you ask a group of students that don't know anything, you're just going to get random all over the board. If I ask it in maybe an upper level class, they lean to the left. They, they, because you can, you can drop a pin on which one you pick. In this audience, you're probably going to lean to the middle. I'm going to guess if you're, if I'm in this audience, and you. And we think about that, but it's all leading up to where I'm getting to of what defines quality. If this picture, you, if you think of it as quality grade, we're going to obviously pick the one on the left. Not many people are going to pick the fat one on the, on the right if they don't even, don't even know anything about marble. 
So what is quality? And as we think about that and we think about quality, it's the satisfaction that the consumer gets from the product. And the most important thing I tell anyone in any industry or anybody that I talk to, you have to know who your consumer is or your customer. So who's the customer? Who's going to buy the product and what do they want? And in the end, we're all going to be consumers. We're all going to consume steaks. A question I ask every class I taught on Wednesday, I teach four classes on Wednesdays, and I asked them all last week, I put a slide up of what was their favorite meat, and their choices were beef, pork, chicken, or other. And it's about, I'd say about 70% of my students to 80 will put beef. And the very next question has 10 fast food chains on it, and I ask, which is your favorite fast food chain? And about 90% overwhelmingly click on Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and I'm like, we're doing something wrong in the beef industry. We've got to figure out how we get, how do we get you to pick that? And I, I would, I tell them all the time, I would pick Chick-fil-A. I don't know which one of these I necessarily pick, but that's not the one. And I'm like, you don't like cheeseburgers? And they're like, well, we pick beef because we like steak. So we can't make them all taste like middle meats. We can't make the whole carcass taste like middle meats. And if we could, we could solve a lot of our issues. But as we think about that, we think about the customer and what they want. If we are the stalker guy, what do we want? We want one that's going to do well, gain well, work in our environment. Same thing for the feeder. Uh, and then it depends on how we're going to sell it. Are we going to sell it on the grid? Are we going to just sell it on live basis? And then who's going to be my retailer or my restaurant? What do I need? Do I have to have high-end steaks? Or do I, am I okay with select? Am I okay with um, no roll like Golden Corral? So all those things come into play on our selection, and that makes it what's so difficult. Just in the United States alone, if we think of all of our consumers and our population that we have, and then we get into our export markets, we have so many people that are going to eat our product. And we like that. And we, are happy about it, but that means we have to have a lot of different things. Because if we don't know, if we know anything, the in the United States, choice is unbelievable. The number of choices we have. I don't know how many of you go and walk around Walmart or other grocery stores, and you, it's it's amazing to me. But one of the most amazing aisles I go down, and I encourage everybody to do this, is the canned meat aisle. They have the weirdest things you've ever seen. And I don't know who the consumer of most of those products is, but if you ever have just an extra moment and you're walking through the Walmart, look at the canned meats and you will be amazed. You might not do a lot of purchasing on that aisle, but you will be amazed um, at what you find there. So, and one big thing that we talk about is it's hard because there's a big difference between quality and quality grade. Because quality um, is going to include so many things, and it's going to be that satisfaction that you get from that product, like I said. Like, maybe these chairs, for example, maybe they're not, they're quality to some of you, maybe not to others. Um, some things that we think about day in and day out, brand names, maybe it's type of bread, maybe lettuce, um, is it quality product or is it not? And how much should I have to pay for it? And that's something that quality grade, even though price is influenced in there, really all quality grade is trying to do is estimate eating satisfaction. That's its goal. It tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. And we do, it's the best thing that we've had for, it's had some changes to it for almost 100 years now. We've had a, quality, a grading system in the United States, and we've only had to the quality grades about six changes those hundred years so it works I've spent um, much of my career and many of my colleagues and mentors have looking for better thing better ways to estimate that than marbling and maturity at the 12th and 13th grade. and we still haven't found it so it's it's really good and the that it, it resonates with people even though many consumers don't know that crime means that it's young maturity and it has a certain number of flex of it 
marbling in the ribeye or in a muscular fat percentage. Most people couldn't tell you that, but that means something to them. USDA choice means something to people. They associate that with quality, so that's, that's important in the quality of that product. So with quality grade values determining um, that choice select spread and that difference, We've heard a lot about that today, and we've heard that you know we're grading about 80% choice in the United States right now. We have been sustaining that for a while, and I will challenge as I talk to a lot of people: Is that are we really looking at a different base now? Are we really looking at more of between low choice and premium choice in those premium programs? Because I, it's almost like now. It's because that spread stays so wide. We saw it narrow in the, in the winter and spring like we normally do this year. But because it, it widens back so quickly, are we really looking at that as more of a discount than in a select, almost like a noble discount at some point? And so we have to think about that premium choice. And then when we talk about quality grade and how they fit in various branded beef programs. So with maturity, we know that as animals age, they um, increase in their myoglobin and it changes meat color. And meat color is one of the most important things to purchasing decisions in the United States because we associate that nice, bright, cherry red color with quality. And so that, that's really important as they advance in their maturity. We used to only use the thoracic vertebrae right there. And as we know, as animals age, that turns to that turns to bone in that cartilage. Now, in uh, we use dentition a lot more in teeth. As long as they're deemed under 30 months of age, they can still be graded as prime choice and select. So as long as they're um, under on dentition, because there's re there was research out there that said, hey, that's more logical. We teeth are a much better estimate than that actual skeletal maturity. So those things are. Those things are really important. And then we've heard a lot about intermuscular fat today and how important it is to quality. And it may not, or quality grade. And so it's the other thing besides maturity. And that's, again, the best thing we have to go off of. But how much does it impact overall palatability? And there's research out there that says that it might account for as little as 10% of the variation to up to 30% of the variation. So doesn't account for as much as we want it to, but it accounts for enough that it's really important. And it, so it may not to tenderness, but it impacts flavor also. So as a consumer, we're not very good at distinguishing the difference between tenderness, flavor, and juiciness. If you get a really dry steak, you just have a bad eating experience. If you get a really tough steak, you have a bad eating experience. And we're trying to estimate that. So we know that marbling contributes to both of those. And the higher grades, all they're doing is they have less variation than the lower grades. So prime, you may get a bad one in prime, but there's a lot less chance. You may get a bad one in choice, but a lot less chance because that variation, that standard deviation between the average gets a lot greater when we get into select and our low low grades. So it's it's critically important. To our, uh, to our grading system and to consumer satisfaction. So with yield grades, um, we talk, you've heard a lot of people talk about yield and that dressing percentage. And so the grade to most producers would include both yield and quality grade. And this is one thing that as a consumer, you don't think anything about. You don't think about, they don't think about yield grade or cutability, percentage boneless bonus concentrate retail cuts from those four main cuts. They just see the steak laying there in the retail case or on their plate in the restaurant. But a packer will tell you this is vitally important to them because that yield and what they, the yield grade and that cutability percentage and box feed yield, how much they can sell out the door for that same overhead cost is very, very important. So these additional pounds, as long as they're not too heavy, and if we can get it in cutability so we can get leaner, heavier muscle ones, or make that more valuable to have those animals. And that's why you don't see large premiums for yield grades, but you, get, you see huge discounts for those that get into the yield grade fours and fives. So that's a reason to 
make sure and assess those things. The four things that go into them, we've had the yield rates since the 60s and they haven't been updated <coughs> since the 60s. So cattle have changed dramatically. So that's one thing that we, we talk about a lot in our industry, but it takes a lot to make a great change. So that can be a challenge. When we use hot carcass weight, fat thickness, and we look at, in yield grades, we look at fat opposite the ribeye, and then we make adjustments to the whole carcass. So we can look over the loin, the rib, chub, ram. Now, with instrument grading, they have multiple variables and locations that they can take measures, and they can plug it into the equation and give you cutability percentage, so it's a little bit different. A lot of plants aren't even stamping yield grades onto those carcasses anymore. So that's a little change there. The ribeye area, and then a lot of plants use the standard uh, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat percentage nowadays for the old. I think I have another picture right here. Oops. So I'll go back one. So now I ask the question, which is the more profitable? Well, you got to have a lot more information than this picture to know that. You have to know if you were just the feeder, what it cost to buy it in the first place, how did it gain, what it, all those things about. There's so many questions. If you were the producer, um, how much did it cost um, to raise it? How did it, well, how did it lean? All, there's so many variables, you can't answer that. And so that's, that's something that is continually a challenge and we, we think about as we look at and then a beast, which is the most valuable? Again, a very difficult question. Um, more than likely, the middle to a packer is the most valuable. Well, let me rephrase that, not to a packer. The packer, many packers will tell you the one on the right is the most valuable to them. To a retailer in the middle one, probably the main to retail, the high-end steakhouse, that's the most valuable to that purveyor, the guy cutting steaks, and then selling it at restaurants. It's going to cost you the most as a state to buy because of its quality. The one on the left loses a lot of value because it's really low quality. It's going to be considered no old standard. It's going to have to go into a low-end program. So that's it's going to lose a lot of its um, value that it's gaining in its yield. So it's yield grade because it is really high yielding and really large ribeye. Now I'm talking about ribeye size when I'm, while I'm on this picture in just a second. As we've heard that there, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be a balance between ribeye size and weight. And as an industry, especially on the meat industry side, we've got to come up with solutions to cut these differently, to prepare them and to present them to consumers in a way that we can have these larger ribeyes. Because to sustain and to feed the world and give them high quality protein sources, we have to be able to do this versus cutting half an inch thick steaks. We've got to have a presentation method where we can still have inch thick steaks or thicker for the positive eating experience and get repeat customers. Because if we take like a ribeye size, even the left or the right at those sizes, and we try to cut that an inch thick, we're at 18 ounce, 16, 18, 20 ounce ribeyes at that point, and we can't present that to most consumers. And we can't even sell that at retail because it gets the cost of the package price too high. So those challenges, uh, we've talked a lot about that for the last, it's really been about the last 10 years of alternative cutting methods and how to do things differently. It just hasn't taken off. It hasn't, um, <laughs> Packers haven't started fabricating different, a little bit. We'll see every now and then they'll take that cat muscle off the ribeye, that's by now. But a lot of us as consumers really like that outside muscle on the ribeye. And so we don't want that taken off. So developing that and, and gaining those markets is something that is really important to helping our consumer. I don't think I have any more pictures if you want to go back to the other company. Um, so, why do we produce more pounds? Bottom line is your pay still based on price per pound. I mean, you, that's, 
And I will never forget, I taught with a professor at Angelo State, and he told every, he taught introduction to animal science when I was there, and he told every kid in the class, every year, every semester, that there's only two things that matter. The Dallas Cowboys are the best football team on earth, and money drives everything. And in that, in, in a pretty, pretty simple uh, solution, but until you're paid on not per pound, or you don't buy and sell things per pound, it's still important to the bottom line. It also we produce pounds to feed more people. It's efficiency and overhead costs, like I talked about. You can slaughter one at the same, you can slaughter a 600 pound carcass, so 1,000 or 1,100 pounds here, the same price basically as you can slaughter a 1,500 pounds. Now there is a limit, and we can't push, we can't push to, if once we get to that 16, 1,700 and beyond the live weight, we start having some issues with design of our packing plants because rail heights, um, a lot of our boxes are not, are, and that's really expensive equipment that that goes through for seal, sealing and packaging and all those things. If we push over that, we have to completely redesign. And we can do that, and we might have to move that as an industry, we may have to move that and make that change, but that's going to be resisted. Um, we're still, you pretty much have to get to 1050 before you get a discount on those carcass weights are a very big one. And, but that, and that keeps going up. We keep saying as meat scientists, you're pushing the edge. You're going to get, you can't push it anymore. And the packer just keeps upping that number on us. So I don't, they have, 1050 is kind of hell for a little while. But I even remember when I was in college, I mean, you thought things were huge if they weighed 900. And I, getting advanced in my maturity, but hopefully so, um, so those are things that we have to think about for as we do push those weights, those alternative cutting methods, and the how we can handle that and move those through facilities and make that work. So there may have to be some thought and redesign. Those are really expensive changes uh, to our to our major factors. Um, and then cutability, and we know it's not just weight, it's yield grade, that red meat yield, or cutout value, same thing. So why produce cattle with premiums? Uh, profitability, palatability, if we're talking about quality premiums. But most importantly, we need to produce demand. We need to have repeat customers and gain market share. And how do we gain market share? We do that in a lot of ways, but we produce consistent products, which you've heard about. Consistency is key, and that's one of our biggest challenges, I think, in our industry, is making products that are consistent, provide the same thing to whoever the customer is, all down the line. And then what does that consumer want? They want to have that experience. It depends on where you're a consumer at. Are you going to the high-end steakhouse? Jeff and I like to do that a lot. Those of you that know us. So. Um, do you grill out? We also do that a lot. And we also eat at McDonald's a lot. But which one of these people are you? And, and how do they fit? And where does that fit in our... We, we moved and we changed. We all started cooking a lot more in the last four months. We, um, we look for ways to have these products to eat at home. We still... Price still drives. Convenience drives us. We name brands like I've talked about, recommended from other people, and those repeat purchase things are important. Because you don't have to pull this one up. This just says, this was going to let you all type in, like what do you think the buzzwords are for consumers? What do you hear as buzzwords? What do you, what do you think? Like what are people saying? What are, what's the biggest buzzwords you hear in the, in, in, from consumers right now? What do you think they say? Locally sourced, that's huge. Like, local. <coughs> Sustainability, huge. What else? Any others? Like, we can get here GMO free a lot. That one is not going to have any meat that's GMO. We can hear gluten free a lot. That, that's one of my favorites, is when you see meat packaged as gluten free. That one is a great one. But those uh, antibiotic-free, 
um, sustainably raised, um, animal well-being, animal uh, welfare, how it's handled, where everything that is just so it's consumer feelings. It's how they feel. Um, humanely handled, direct market. It's it's just constant hormone free. We, we heard Colt talk about that and how some of those things and antibiotic free and NHTC fit into that premium market. It's because if we can sell it to somebody at a higher price because we can label it a certain way and say a certain thing about it, that adds value. So anything we do to add value impacts our bottom line. So as we can do that and tell those stories, this won't work, but I'll share this with you. This is like the coolest graph ever. Um, I thought that it was on Facebook a while back, but it shows the change in fast food growth over time, and it shows how many restaurants are across the world, and it, sh it shows them growing since the 1970s up to today. It's really cool. I'll share that so people can see it. Unfortunately, this is a buzzword that I don't like, um, that most of us don't like. So alternative proteins, plant waste, cell culture, fake meat, clean meat, all those things. Um, we we try we try these in class um, over time. This is something that my students this semester are not going to get experience because they told me I can't serve you food during these times. But uh, some of these are the absolute worst things I might have ever tasted. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you guys have tried them, but impossible you could go to Burger King. They put enough ketchup. I don't know that you can tell. Um, and then the Beyond Burger, this uh, Boca Burger is really bad. One, it is the lowest calorie, but it is, it's not good. We've had a little, we have one company that sent us some cell culture meat. Um, to do research on, but they sent it and I took it out of the box and I'm like, what is this? It was like, let it, they were smaller pieces than the end of a pencil eraser. And I'm like, how are we going to research this? And then, so we were like trying to mimic it in size with beef and we try to put it in and cook it and like we just put it in boiling water and it took like eight minutes. And I'm like, no, this is it was, it's very strange. Now it's not from Memphis Meats, but it's it's another company that's working on some things. So if you look at things and you see the big difference that should be noted, and this is why as a beef industry we should tell our story. The protein and the sodium. Um, it's unbelievable the amount of sodium that these other uh, alternative protein sources have. And then the next thing, and a lot of you have probably seen this, is the ingredient list it is just unreal. Uh, and it's, I think that as we think about a buzzword and we think about people, natural is a word I didn't put up here, and some of those things, if we tell the story of this and we really tell that story to consumers, and they can see those differences and they understand that you're doing everything right as producers and you're eating. I mean, it can have hormones added, it can still be called natural ground beef um, or growth hormones. So it's it's a natural product. It's um, I, another word that, you know, is uh, a buzzword that's maybe not my favorite either is organic. Um, I, I try to sell the fact that all organic has carbon, right? Um, we could use that as a theory, but that, that one doesn't go very well. No, that not work. But it is, so these things. And then this one is really surprising to me that our industry hasn't just grabbed hold of, and because this is just straight on their page, and it literally says obtain animal cells. Feed the cells nutrients, and then delicious meat. Go. In the culture we live in right now, I can't imagine that consumers will get too excited about obtaining animal cells and feed the cells. Um, so I don't know on this product how it's going to go. Um, it's going to probably be a fad. It's probably going to be really expensive. It is going to sell. I think people, some people will try it. 
Um, I don't think it's sustainable. Um, I guess if they can push the cost down enough, uh, I think it's pretty scary product. But I, I mean, as far as competing with our industry, I don't know what it will taste like. I ask a lot of questions about it. One of the things I teach about is conversion of muscle to meat. And if you grow cells, like I don't know if when you take the nutrients away, it'll just convert and then it'll have meat properties. Because muscle, living muscle tissue has very different properties than meat. So that's that's a lot of questions like I ask and I don't get a lot of answers. I was at a conference this summer, well, or I'm online on Zoom, that had a lot of a lot of presentations about this. And some other trends, um, obviously Amazon is a big trend and food over Amazon and then the different diets and the meal programs and then chefs and using all of those things are pretty important. So this is, I think, one of my, I like this quote a lot. I like to use it when I talk to my judging teams. A racehorse that consistently runs just a second faster than another horse is worth millions more. So give the effort to go a little faster, do a little better. And I think as we talk about quality and we talk about improvement, and remember the definition doesn't have to be marble, but a little more goes a long way. So whatever that quality is. So I think that's, um, we can all try to set our goal a little higher. Um, I probably haven't been very positive about that in the last few days of teaching school, so maybe I need to work on this myself. So I'll, I'll try in the next few days to do better. But the things I think Charlet has is it has that growth and efficiency. It can produce those heavier endpoints and not exceed the maximums with proper management. It has the red meat yield, that cutability that is, and can be comparable with marbling and still find that balance. So I think those things are very important. And I think bottom line is understand what's being produced. You gotta be able to know that and understand your product for consumers to understand that. And then we talk about this all the time and you guys talk about it in the entire industry. We gotta tell our story. And I don't even like to tell mine that often because a lot of times people that grew up on maybe a farm ranch, we're pretty personal people and we don't tell a lot of our hardships, our trials, or even our successes. But you gotta do that. And you gotta tell those things that pull on people's heartstrings can't tell them because of the money, because that just doesn't hit them and sell it to them. So what makes Charlotte great to you? Why do you do it? Why do you raise Charlotte? What's special? I, when I first moved to Oklahoma because I lived in San Angelo, Texas, the camera asked me to come talk all about goats all the time, because I guess I had been in San Angelo. I'm like, I don't know anything about goats. Well, I'll try. I mean, I had given some presentations, done a little research, and I, every presentation I said they were goat producers. Every time I start by saying, "Do you eat goat?" and they would say, "Yeah," and I'm like, "How often?" Well, we've tried it. Once. I'm like, "That's not going to work." If you want to sell goat meat, you got to be a consumer of it too. So you got to be able to tell people your story and why is it special. So that's the message I would leave. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Doc, I had a question in class today that's maybe a little unrelated, but it goes into sustainability. Um, we talk about antibiotic residue and applying into withdrawal periods and whatnot. What measures are in place to ensure that those withdrawal periods are being stayed? I guess is the question the student asked. So the question was, um, what is go what ensures that antibiotic residues, the withdrawal periods, are tested for? So USDA has specific guidelines, and those are they. It depends on the type of plant you're in. If you're in a bull cow on bull facility, or if you're in a fed steer and heifer facility, or depending other species, but they have specific guidelines of how many percentage that they test. And they ensure, and they test, uh, they test liver and other organs as well as carcass meat to ensure that they don't find any residues. Well, to the certain levels, and if they do find any, then that 
um, wherever that product was sourced from. That animal, if, if still there, it, well, those animals have to be retained until tested and passed. And they're, they're really quick tests. And if they do find any residue levels, that source, whether it be a feedlot or producer, is then contacted and those will be tested and that so that's a really safeguarded system by USDA food safety inspection. Traceability would be pretty tough on the cold cow and wool though, right? Yeah, it, cold cow and wool would be really tough and those have so those are gonna be because that would come back to like cell barn issue and but that so that's that's really challenging. And, but that one is very safeguarded. I mean we see that more Honestly, we see a little bit more residue issue if we usually find it with dairy cold cows. That would be the more common one. But it's it's regulated enough that they um, most of your producers there's there's just not really an issue on residue. Another question for Gretchen. What a great job! Thanks for being here, and uh, this.